Hey guys, Tyler here. A lightsaber, sometimes erroneously referred to as a laser sword, is a melee weapon typically used by Jedi, Sith, and a cadre of other Force-sensitive and even some rare non-Force-sensitive individuals. In this video, I'll discuss their internal mechanics, structure, design aesthetic, and more. So without further ado, let's get started. A lightsaber consists of a plasma beam powered by an internal power cell and directed by one or more kyber crystals, with pure weightless plasma usually emitted from a metal hilt and suspended within an adjustable electromagnetic containment field. The crystal-focused beam of plasma creates an oval arc, the blade, that circumferences back to its source within the hilt, thus generating a controlled energy circuit that can be shut on and off at will. An internal superconductor transfers the returning looped energy from the negative charged flux aperture back into the power cell, and consequently, the cell would only expend power when the energy arc, or loop, is broken, such as when the lightsaber cuts through something. Because of the gyroscopic effect generated by the looping plasma beam, wielding a lightsaber requires skill and training, and is greatly enhanced in conjunction with the Schwartz. I mean, the force, the cosmic living force. Generally used for both offense and defense, a lightsaber can cut through virtually anything, from flesh to thick blast doors. The only things that can block a lightsaber's incoming attack are weapons or other objects made with material that conducts energy. Among others, trained force-sensitive users can even use a lightsaber to deflect blaster bolts, and with some extra skill, they can reflect shots back towards the shooter or another target. Experienced Jedi can even employ lightsabers to absorb force lightning. The most common form factor is a single-bladed lightsaber, usually extendable to 130 centimeters, or 51 inches, though we do see some double-sided lightsabers, or shorter shotos, throughout the franchise as well. According to The Clone Wars, another crucial component of the lightsaber is the emitter matrix, also referred to as a high-energy flux aperture. A saber's blade is emitted out the handle through the emitter matrix, which keeps a tight magnetic grip on the beam and allows it to reliably extend to a predetermined length. A lightsaber could explode shortly after ignition if the emitter matrix was inverted, a tactic once used by Petro, a Jedi initiate, to subdue a group of pirates. Some lightsabers also feature a non-lethal low-power setting used for training, indicating that there is variability in the yield of the plasma stream, but paramount in the operation of other specially designed lightsabers, including Kylo Ren's, which uses an unstable crystal, is the installation of laterally facing vents to divert excess energy. Between this and the lightsaber's immense cutting power, it becomes prudent to ask, how can a lightsaber both store and emit so much energy? Actually, before we get into the energy storage aspect, let's first talk about the basics of what kind of energy lightsabers harness. To start, what exactly is plasma, other than a kind of TV? Well, it's an excited state of matter that consists of a soup of ionized gas and free electrons. The energy produced by the separation of electrons from atomic nuclei can produce enormous amounts of light and heat. Indeed, one of the most common forms of plasma is lightning strikes, and it's also commonly associated with the nuclear fusion reactions within stars. Thus, it's easy to see how sufficiently excited plasma can reach thousands of degrees. How in the world could you contain such a thing without burning yourself? Well, today, we already have multiple technologies and processes that utilize superheated plasma for various purposes. One of these processes is plasma cutting, such as with a plasma torch. Plasma cutting involves using jets of accelerated plasma to cut through electrically conductive materials like steel, aluminum, brass, and copper. Plasma cutting sees widespread use all the way from large-scale industrial applications down to small hobbyist shops due to its high speed and low cost. The basic process involves channeling plasma through a focused nozzle into the material being cut, forming a complete electric circuit. The electrical arc formed within the gas delivers sufficient heat to melt the material and blow hot molten metal out of the way, thus separating the workpiece. Today on How It's Made, 
The arc is generated by a high voltage spark ionizing the air within the torch head, making it conductive. Current flows from an electrode through the nozzle, which avoids being burnt by a control system that cuts the electrical connection between the workpiece and the nozzle. Thus, the plasma stream flows from the electrode to the workpiece, and the electrical arc remains separated from the torch head. Okay, this is all good and well, but it still doesn't answer another major question. How can lightsabers emit a bolt of plasma from the hilt that stops in mid-air? If you cross the streams of two plasma torches, it's not going to look like a fight between a Sith and a Jedi. Now you might say, but what about holograms? Surely those would work. Well, technically, a lightsaber isn't what a hologram would look like. Real holograms only offer the illusion of depth by projecting laser light through a glass prism. When viewed from certain angles, the image created may look three-dimensional, but in fact, it's not. Indeed, it's this depiction of fully 3D projections, more akin to volumetric displays, that has given the public overly high expectations for the capability of holograms. The creation of so-called hard light objects would require the use of force fields, a technology that's at least a century away from being realized. And it would kind of defeat the purpose of a plasma weapon that can penetrate its target the way that a, well, sword would. This, as well as the capping off of a plasma beam in a neat cylinder, is arguably one of the biggest hurdles facing the plausibility of a lightsaber-like weapon. There are, however, some developments that could help bring this sort of technology closer to reality. Scientists have actually been able to guide plasma using extremely tiny lasers that focus their beams in a specific direction, which can, in fact, generate interactive light displays that float in mid-air. If the laser pulses are emitted very quickly in rapid succession, say once every hundred trillionth of a second, then plasma can stay cool enough that you can harmlessly interact with it. But by simply decreasing the frequency of the laser emissions, the individual plasma beams have longer to heat up, meaning the self-contained beam could theoretically sear right through you at a very high temperature. This is how you can get a quasi-holographic object with a wide range of intensity as a weapon. As for what happens when two of these plasma beams meet each other, well, that also depends on a lot of other factors, but given what I've just described, it seems reasonable that by manipulating the frequency and angle at which these plasma beams resonate, they could repel each other when coming into contact while still being able to pierce their intended targets. Regardless, it will take a lot of time and effort to develop the necessary materials to avoid overheating of hypothetical plasma weapons. Real directed energy weapons like the industrial-sized lasers and plasma railguns developed by the US military can produce pretty staggering yields. But even so, the heat generated by a single firing can actually damage the weapon's internal machinery. This is why it's unclear how soon such technology would see practical field use, especially since many of these projects have already been in the in-development stage for decades. Also, keep in mind, directed energy particle weapons like we see in sci-fi effectively function as particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider, except more like the Tiny Hadron Collider. These particle accelerators harness electromagnetic fields that accelerate charged particles along a predetermined path, and they use electrostatic lenses to focus these streams to produce collisions. But while tiny particle accelerators could theoretically be housed in such a handheld weapon, just as cathode ray tubes were housed in old CRT monitors, the yield associated with these weapons is still far, far beyond our reach. That said, in the future, it's likely that we will continue to master engineering on increasingly smaller scales of the universe. Even as concepts like Moore's Law reach their physical limits, we could still manipulate special metals to act as ultra-powerful heat sinks and cold plates. This would still be necessary, I'd argue, in a sufficiently powerful lightsaber, hence why we see thermal vents on Kylo Ren's lightsaber. And the Kyber Crystal likely acts as a superconducting magnet, managing the flow of charged particles towards their target. So, could we build a lightsaber today? Absolutely not, but the seeds for the technology necessary to make one are already here, and promising results from the experiments with focusing plasma beams to stop in midair paint a rather optimistic picture in my view. 
we just need to innovate new ways to manage the heat associated with superheated plasma being concentrated in a hand weapon. Until then, lightsabers will probably remain a fantastical technology, but an intriguing one nonetheless. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. And big thanks to Kevin Johnson for becoming my new top patron by joining the $50 tier. Kevin's been a longtime supporter of the channel, and I'm excited to have him on board. That's all I have for this week. May the Force be with you.